All right, this is uh, Freddie Funes here at uh, Shadowsoft, and I am sitting with um, Rob Sanders, who is one of the, he is the head developer for Security Blanket right now. And um, just want to make sure that everybody is on the call right now for this uh, demo. Is everybody there? Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So thank you very much for your time. And we're going to go ahead and, and just jump into Security Blanket right now. So um, Security Blanket uh, was first developed uh, with its main intention was, you know, the problem out there was, you know, we need a tool, admins need a tool to lock down uh, Linux OS. And so we came out with this tool and slowly but surely, I mean, it has done a great, great job of making an impact on you know, all of our customers that are currently using it right now. And um, the main goal really of, of Security Blanket, it does one thing really, really well, and that is harden your OS repeatedly. Um, and so you can guarantee that you're going to say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and lock down this OS and know consistently over and over again it's going to do the exact same thing. And that's really a huge time saver for um, end users because if you can imagine in a company um, that might have a team where they say, okay, go lock down a bunch of these servers, uh, you have different level of experiences, although you're following a guideline to tell you these are the things that you're supposed to do, um, the end goal result, you can still do it various different ways. And um, with that being said, there's so many different companies that have more than just one OS that they're running currently at a company. And so Security Blanket allows you to go ahead and lock down multiple OSs um, with different functionalities uh, consistently and predictability over and over again. So this is what uh, Security Blanket does. It has great uh, features, reporting capabilities in here, and also a nice little undo function. We're, we're going to go and get into that right now. Um, Security Blanket currently is... Um, there's two different ways that you can deploy it. Uh, the first way is a standalone product, and the standalone product is uh, one license for one server, regardless if that server is a virtual or it's an actual physical machine. Um, it's tied to the MAC address right now, and so it's just a one-to-one -one correlation for that. Um, from there, we have an Enterprise Edition, and what we're looking at here right now is the Enterprise Edition. The Enterprise Edition uh, consists of an admin console, and then that manages a whole host of clients at one time. So uh, the thought behind that was really, um, you know, instead of walking up and doing a standalone license to each server, this is going to be such a time saver. Uh, usually I recommend if you're going to be doing more than I don't know, three or four machines at a time. Um, it's, it's just beneficial to go ahead and get the Enterprise Edition with the Admin Console because you're only doing it once where you're going to be creating a profile uh, one time or using one of the predefined guidelines uh, within Security Blanket and apply it to all those, you know, four machines at one time as opposed to walking up to one machine, installing Security Blanket, locking it down, doing everything you need to do with it, and then doing that again uh, multiple times. So it's just so much easier, much more convenient, a time saver when you're using uh, the Enterprise Edition. So so uh, with the Enterprise Edition, you can install it. it uh, Security Blanket works on uh, on Linux OSs, you know, the typical most uh, popular ones out there, Red Hat, uh, CentOS, OpenSUSE, Novell SUSE. Uh, so there's 10, Oracle Enterprise, Oracle Enterprise Linux, uh, also um, Z-Series for mainframe for IBM uh, for both, for Red Hat and for the Red Hat and SUSE. So, um, you know, Security Blanket works on those different uh, OSs. So, um, the Solaris, I'm, yeah, uh, Solaris 10. And so, uh, with that being said, you can um, ha you do not need a dedicated server to run the admin console. You can have it on the same server that you want to lock down. So it, you know you do not need a dedicated server. The only time really you would uh, want or need a dedicated server is if you're doing I mean hundreds or thousands you know of clients at one time where you want to make sure that you have enough memory, right? Enough. Um, what else would you need? I mean, really. 
yep. to be running hundreds of thousands of them at a time. If you're running that many clients, the thing you would want is your enterprise console machine to have, probably have at least four gigs of RAM. That's kind of common today. Right. Uh, several hundred gigabytes of uh, drive space to keep your reports long term. Individual reports average between five and ten megabytes, but obviously when you get hundreds of those, that, that space mounts up. Right. Um, and so, so you know, uh, Secure Blanks works on those, those different OSs, and so then this is the admin uh, console right here. And so what you will do is you're going to install a small little dispatcher onto servers that you want to lock down. Um, it's very small. It's very lightweight. Is it still somewhere around like the one meg? Somewhere on there. The resident stack sizes will be less than 10 megs okay. uh, on any box. Okay. But it's it takes up very little system resources. Okay. And um, the other uh, thing that I mentioned to you about those clients is that they are not always on. They're not always um, talking, feeding information back to the console. They're relatively just waiting there um, to get instructions from the admin console. So. Uh, we did that on purpose because we didn't want to be taking up resources from your network. And so, um, you know, w with that being said, you know, it's, it's, it's a great tool to, to harden, to set up, and to go back and check those machines. Um, so let's keep going. So with the client, you're going to go ahead and install the small little dispatcher. Then from there, um, you're going to point the admin console to point the client, the client the back console. to the admin console. And then from there, um, you'll accept them, and we'll start to go over into the nitty-gritty of exactly how you start to set those clients and groups up and things like that. So uh, what we're looking at here is the main page for the admin console. This is just giving you some general information on the licenses, how many uh, clients you have associated with this uh, machine right now. And then this is the most recent activity that you have done um, with the admin console. So let me go ahead and um, get this started. Um, these are the security profiles that come out of the box with security blankets. So um, you can't really see it. They're really tiny, but they're little penguins. They're essentially this one miniaturized here. And so these are the ones that come out of the box with security blanket. So one thing that you know I want to tell you about security blanket is that it's really great in the aspect of that you can customize and you can create um, these profiles. Uh, let's go into one here. One of the most uh, popular ones that we have is the disastig. And so it, there you go. And so what we're looking at is that currently we're above 300 modules right now. Right. Yeah, so we're above 300 modules. And so you have to think of a module like a Tinker Toy or a Lego block, okay? So you're able to put these uh, modules together however you want, and you can name it whatever you want. Um, we took the modules necessary in order to support the DISA RHEL 6 stick. So these are all the modules associated with that profile there, okay? So right now, because this is a profile that comes out of the box, um, you can only view the different settings that are here, okay? You can't go in there and customize these because this is an out-of-the-box profile. I'm going to show you where you can go in there and start changing different settings and things like that. Um, for the, um, the modules that are here, you can go ahead and just click on any of these. It's going to expand, give you additional information about that module. Uh, let me see if we can pick a nice, really GC one. Uh, let's go to another one. Where's the one that I always use? <laughs> what files is going to go into to change once changes are made? Different at, at the configuration file, but there's a little bit of some options to it. Let's see this one here. That's this one? Yeah. Okay, let's see. This one. No. I want that little box. That is the one. I'm looking for a really nice one to show um, how it categorizes it. Um, of course. Yeah. So, when that profile is new for you? 
Uh, this one is not going to be it. But well, this is one. This is one that I want to show you. So uh, essentially, this is going to give you additional information on this module, and then basically, it's telling you if you're using one of these OSs here. This is the configuration file we're going to go into, and then we're going to go ahead and change the settings to this. Okay, and then it cross references the different guidelines that call out for this. So um, depending on the module that you're in, um, you know it can affect either all the OSs, and then it'll change you. It'll tell you exactly what settings are going to be changed. But um, so you see where you can go in there and you can uh, expand those and see additional um, information on each module. Like this one, here you go. So it's telling you the OS, the configuration file it's going to go into, and then what it's going to do. And then it cross references all the different guidelines that are there. Okay. So, with that being said, let's go back and let's look go back to security profiles. And I'm going to show you real quickly how easy it is to go ahead and just start to edit a profile or even just create one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and copy the disastigs and then I'm just going to name it or whatever, give it today's date. 10 10. Oh, number locks. 10 10 15. The profile. And so right here you'll see that I just copied this uh, profile in its entirety, and now you can see where it says modify. So now I can go in here, and if I want to, I can start to modify these different settings. Okay, so that gives you the ability to go ahead and do that. Um, you can take this one step further and say, I want to go ahead and start to add or remove some of these modules. So right now, these are the ones that are um, associated with this uh, profile, you see where the green check box is. Those are the ones that are associated right now with this profile. So I can easily go in there and say I want to take out the audit rules, the block system accounts, but I want to go ahead and add a couple of different uh, modules on here. So I'm going to I'm going to add uh, disable Bluetooth, disable boot, and there you go and disable broadcast. And now I'm going to go ahead and hit save profile. So with that being said, I saved this profile and then we put a nice little feature in here where we can compare security profiles. So I'm going to create a new comparison and I'm going to select the original one, the one that I originally uh, copied and then this is the one that I did copy. And then you can render all of our reports for security blanket, either HTML, PDF, text, or CSV. These last two really are there uh, for customers that want to export the reports, put it into their own internal reports. It gives you the ability to do that. Um, everything I'm going to show you today will be uh, HTML. So I'm going to go ahead and create this. So this is quickly telling me this is the DISA REL stock uh, profile. This is the one that we just uh, customized. And it's telling you what's different here. Five modules have different parameter values, and three modules are only present in the profile B, which is this one, because remember I added three. These two are only present in A because those are the ones that I removed. And then here it goes even uh, further where it's actually showing you. So these modules are only present in this one because these are the ones that I added. You can click on those, you can expand it, read a little bit more about that module, and once again, it cross-references um, the different guidelines that call out for that. And then, once again, these two are only present, these modules are only present in this one um, because we had taken them out of that one. So that's why they're only present in there. So this is a nice um, you know, tool to have, especially when you start to go in there and start customizing different um, profiles and saying, what are the differences between these two? So. Um, and now I'm going to show you how you can just create a new one, which is really, really uh, nice and easy. So I'm just going to name this uh, Custom Today. And then I'm going to start to add or remove modules. And basically, this is a blank slate, right? I mean, these are all the modules where I can go in here and I could, if I want, start to read on these modules and then select it. 
and then go hit Save Profile. There's an easier way of doing this. You can hit Search for Modules. And then in the Search for Modules, you can say, okay, I want to do a search on either just my custom profiles that I have right now, only have these two, but you know, if you can imagine, you, you could have 10, 20, 100 different custom profiles here, and that would be your pool that you would look and search in. Um, here you can spe uh, specify and say I want to look in a particular uh, guideline. So you can pick um, NSA and say I want to look just in this guideline. Or you could look uh, and do a search through all the modules. So you can do a word search here and say I want to search for the word password, perform search, and then any modules that um, come up right now, that's what comes up, anything associated with that word password will come up. And so that red box is currently being used. Uh, this red box indicates it's currently being used in the profile that we have, okay? These other ones are not, and same functionality, right? You can click on this, click more, and it expands it, okay? So you still have that same ability. And then you can go in here and say, okay, I'm gonna select this here, um, and then you can hit Add Selected Modules to Profile there. You can also do a search by category, where you can say, okay, I want to search some for everything having to do with mail services. And then everything with mail services will come up. Um, you can do a search by a platform. This is where you can say, okay, I want to see everything related to uh, RHEL 6, perform search and then anything and everything having to do with RHEL 6 will pop up there. So you can also do a search by compliancy. This is where you're getting very specific and very granular and you're looking for something, you know, you're saying for uh, the DISA stigs, either the RHEL 5 or the RHEL 6, you're looking for um, 000262 and you do a search and then it will pull up that one guideline there, and then it tells you this is what it does, these are the different OSs, and this is what it's going to do. And once again, it cross-references all the different guidelines. So those are the different ways that you can do um, a search, and you can also start combining them and say, I want to see everything with passwords, under the category of account management, with the platform being uh, CentOS 5. And then everything having to do with passwords under account management for CentOS 5 pull up. Okay. There's other, uh, there's also a nice way where you can actually start to just combine profiles together if you know exactly um, what are in those profiles. You could say, okay, I'm going to take the one that I'm currently using right now, the this is stick, and I want to combine it with, um, let's just leave it with, um, with the NSA guidelines. I want to combine it with the NSA guidelines. So I'm going to go ahead and hit um, perform search, and then it's going to show me all the modules associated with the NSA guidelines. And then I can say I want to select all of them. I want to say add selected modules to the profile. Right, and then I want to hit Save Profile, and then I want to go back to Custom Today, go back to my Add, uh, Remove Modules, uh, Search for Modules, and then I'm going to take the this and combine both of them together. Perform Search, and then you'll see a lot of red boxes now, right, because um, they overlap. There's uh, things in the... Um, in the NSA guideline that are also being called out for the distinct. So I just selected everything, and then I'm going to hit Add Selected Modules to Profile, Save Profile, and then now, by the magic of security blanket, we have combined two profiles there. Just a note on that uh, process as well. If a module is already in a profile and it's also in uh, a profile that you are trying to add from, so just before you start out with this first profile, if the same module was in the second profile with a different value, 
the first values are being kept. It's not going to override existing values. Okay. Um, so with that being said, let's go back to the profiles here. So I showed you how you could go ahead and just start to use one out of the box. Um, I showed you where you could go ahead and just essentially copy it and then start to customize it, and then also how to create a brand new profile. Um, the import feature is there really if you have already, you know, uh, other machines that you've been using security blanket on, maybe another admin console as well, and you say, you know, this has worked out for this group here, I want to go ahead and take that profile and I want to import it into this group here, into this admin console, it gives you the ability to go ahead and do that. So, um, and then the delete here are, of course, only for the ones that you um, create, the ones that you customize. You cannot delete any of the stock profiles, okay? Um, so after you selected your profile, you're going to go ahead and um, this is your list of clients. And so once again, the process of listing the clients is you um, install the dispatcher and then you point it to the admin console and then this will start to populate. So you'll allow them, you'll deny them. Once you allow them, this will start to populate your list of clients. You can go ahead and click on one of these. It's going to give you additional information about that server right there. Okay, so this is a CentOS box. Um, give you memory, things like that. You can go in here and um, Right, we can refresh that, we can edit this, and um, this is just free text where you can go ahead and start to really customize this. You can say this is for um, mail server, whatever you want to do with this. Location, it's in the basement. Uh, contact, you can John Doe, and you can even put a phone number here if you want. Uh, that's the default port that we use. Um, you can change that, but that is the default port. And so from there, um, you can go ahead and start to take these lists of clients and you can start to associate them uh, within a group. So we did that for these two here. We put these in a PCI profile. Um, what I'm going to go ahead and do right now is I'm going to start to, I'm going to create uh, a disastic profile. So I'm going to go to my group. I'm going to create new. And then I'm just going to call it stick. Uh, and then I'm going to select the profile. Alt. And then I'm just going to pull all these three in. Three or just so? Let's say Rapid EC, both of those two guys are. If the raw five wouldn't apply to either one of them, what to the EC one? Yeah. Um, I mean, is there another profile you think you want to do better where we can use another one in here? We used to use the old SRR profile with this. Yeah. All right, so we'll save the group on this. We don't have a raw six box in here. Oh. Do the raw five. Okay. Um, Not that one. All right there. All right, so then, um, so you you you're able to see how easy it is to really just take clients in and out of groups. So I add that one, associate it with it, and then now I have a stick group. Just to flesh out, so if people are not familiar with why we chose we're all five stick there, uh, the dis of the unit sticks are security guidelines that uh, DISA puts out. They used to put out a generic SIG where each line item in the SIG would say, if you're Solaris, do it this way, if you're Linux, do it that way, if you're IREX, do it this other way, or SUSE, do it this way. They're now moving into a format where they will release an operating system specific SIG document uh, that may have absolutely no relevance to a different OS. EC box that were applied to this uh, group here is, a real, is essentially a ROL5 box, exactly CentOS 5 which the raw files did would apply to. The other two boxes were not read at based uh, operating systems. Okay, and so, um, so I'm gonna go ahead and select this uh, group here. And the first thing that we always recommend is that you go ahead and do a baseline. So I'm gonna start out the process, but then I'm gonna show you what we've already done on some other boxes. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and hit baseline here. Yes on that one. And so this is one that we did earlier. 
And so for this one here, I associated these two different um, clients here. And so from there, I ran different reports. The very first thing that we always, like we said, that you want to do is a baseline. That's going to capture, it's going to take a snapshot of that moment in time right then and there, what that machine looks like. So you're going to go ahead and hit baseline. I'm going to select a client. Uh, and there's that. And then this is the baseline report for that box. So it's going to give you um, everything that is installed on this machine and security blanket just to make sure security blanket is just reporting on what's there it's not going to wave a red flag and tell you hey you need to go and get the latest greatest um, this is where you're going to go get it this is just reporting everything that's on there and then um, it's going to go ahead and over time with various baselines that you do you could do a baseline every day if you want or every other day, however you want to set that up. And then you will start to um, see different changes on there. Um, let me show you, can we do one for the, do we run one for the RELF? I don't think I did. Seven? You can compare the baseline for the, two, the C2 and C3, it's just the different OSs. Yeah, and how about taking this one here? Run another one right now. Yeah, yep. We'll run that one right now and we'll let that one go and then we'll see the changes on there. So after you do a baseline on um on a set of clients, then you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna do a scan. Um there's a quick scan and a scan here. I like to tell it my way. Rob likes to explain it his own way of the quick scan and scan. Um I'm gonna tell you the quick in my my way. And now I'll let Rob go a little bit more technical on you. So uh, the quick scan basically says, okay, you're going to go ahead and scan all these different modules right now. And let's take module A, okay? So within module A, let's say it's checking for four different things, right? That we saw in the different modules, it's calling out for different guidelines. Let's say it gets to the second line item and it says, oh, wait, it failed. It's just going to stop there and it's going to go to the next module. So it's not going to continue within that module and check everything. It's just basically giving you a down and dirty quick snapshot saying, you know, I'm going through this module, wait, something failed. I'm not even going to continue. Why should I? I know that this failed already. I just want to go to the next one and keep going. Um, really, when this was put in place, um, there was a significant, you know, time savings there. But now, because so much work that we've done with under the hood and with security blanket that I've been console, there's really not a huge, huge difference between the quick scan and the scan. Um, honestly, if I was doing this every day, I would just stick with the scan, the full scan assessment. I would not use the quick scan. But really, it's still there. Uh, you can use it if you like. But that's my two cents on it. Rob? Freddie's got it pretty much correct, and quick scan is probably going to be disappearing in a future release. Uh, basically, as you said, within a module, as soon as a module can detect that it failed, it will stop processing that module any farther and proceed on to the next. Uh, the, the output of this is if a quick scan passes to completion, a scan will pass to completion. If a quick scan detects an error, it will report the error and move on to the next module where the scan will report every error that a module finds. So you'll get a partial list of failures in a quick scan, but it can be used as a warm fuzzy uh, for would this module pass have you run a real scan. Right. Um, and so then let's go ahead and show you what an, an assessment looks like. So basically this is kind of like a, a before, right? This is what it looks like right now. And then let me show you um, and after what an apply looks like. And so I'm gonna go back and forth between these two. So you'll see that this uh, client here at CentOS 4.7, we are trying to lock it down to PCI DSS. And so it says here that 95% um, of the modules, uh, 95 modules, sorry, 49% of them failed. And these 30% pass, 
these are other, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And you'll see here that it's clearly telling you to fail. You can click on this, it tells you more about that module, it tells you a module message, and then it cross-references all the different uh, guidelines that call out for that. So you'll see that it's broken out into high risk, medium risk, and then there's low risk. And then you'll see other messages here, OS and A, right, not applicable. So those are all the different categories that are um, within security blanket. So, and as an aside, it's not unusual, uh, depending on the guideline, to have a 50% or higher failure rate on an out-of-the-box install. That's not unusual at all. Right. Um, so that this is the the assessment report, right? The full scan that we did, and then after it finished running, then we hit the apply button for that group, and then we ran the report. And then this is what it looks like after. So well, the apply report you're looking at here is actually showing that we went through and applied without errors to 93 modules. Right. All the ones applied here. It's not doing a scan immediately to say, "Have I passed?" After they applied the done. Right. This is just saying it went in there, it made the changes. So then you still have the ability to go back in here under this group and say, after you did the uh, the scan, and then after you did the apply, you can do another scan if you like. Okay, so it gives you the ability to go ahead and do that. And, and typically, when people and when, once we get to the scheduler portion of it, um, people do do that. They set it up where it's automated, where they say do a baseline first, then do a scan, then do apply, and then do a scan again just to make sure that everything took. So those are the different ways that you can go ahead and set that up. So. With that being said, that's what the scan, that's what an apply does. Um, the undo feature here is uh, you have no idea how many times people have called in or emailed and just gushed over this feature on here. Um, the undo feature, basically if you say, okay, you hit the apply, God forbid something breaks, um, even if you walk out the door, you come back the next day and you notice something is broken, uh, you can go ahead and hit undo and it will just undo everything, all the changes that were made. Um, Rob, you want to throw in a little technical in there? Yes. When we do an apply, we keep track on a per module basis of the changes that we did in that last apply. When the undo comes back through, it will go back, look at that history of what was done per module the last time, and undo that single module, everything that, the last, everything that was done the last time it was applied. We don't have a full history here of every change that the module has made since the dawn of time, but we can undo the last effect that was done. Uh, a good use case for this that has happened on many occasions, let's say you have a Linux box that has been alive for six months and nobody's bothered to change their password since uh, the box was created six months ago. Many of the guidelines say that you have to change your password every 30 to 90 days. You apply a profile with that setting, everybody's passwords will immediately become invalid and nobody can log into the box. Uh, we've had more than a few people who have installed this the first time for a box that's been around for a while and get locked out of their box and call us up in a panic. How do we fix this? Here's a use case for undo. Well, go back, undo your profile. Uh, that will restore the box to where it was. Now they can log in. Okay. And um, all right, so let's see. If we can go back and um, this is notification. Let's see. Oh yeah. So once you um, do different actions here, you'll notice this little red flag here, and you can click on it, and then it's telling it's telling you here what actions have been completed. So we ran that baseline on the 5.7. What we did is we took the um, was it a 5.7? Or what yeah, was it originally? This, this one box that we've had here, we're talking about this RHEL 5.7 upgrade box. It was originally a stock install of Red Hat 5.7 that I scanned with Security Blanket, locked it down, rebooted the box to make all the changes effective, and then uh, upgraded the box using Yum to become a Red Hat 5.8 box. And then I've done a couple extra scans on it so you can see what happens when you do a Yum upgrade on an existing Linux box. So let's see if we can. He, doesn't, he only has the one baseline now. 
Oh, you only did one day? Yeah, well, I just did you one. You just did the one day fine on that box. You didn't do one before. They should have ended it. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, then we can't do that one then. You could. If you ran it based on the EC box, you'd also run that five. Change. You a difference. Yeah, I mean, okay. So let's do the EC versus yeah. what? Versus what? Red 5 7. You can compare baselines or reports against any two machines. Obviously, if the machines are of very different lineages, such as comparing a Solera 10 box to a uh, Red Hat 4 box, you may not make a lot of uh, good knowledge out of that comparison. But uh, <coughs> it gives you the ability to compare two different machines that may be the same OS to see if one drifted from the other one. All right, so uh, that's chugging away. Yeah, it's it's chugging away there. So we'll let that continue to load, and then we'll keep going. So um, going back to the groups here. So uh, we went over all the different action items here. Um, the board is what the board is, right? Um, Basically, it's, it requests all the everyone who gets for a board is said when you get done with that module, punt. Right. Um, uh, one other thing is that you know there are reports as well here for the undo. We didn't do one there. There's a group assessment report here where you can go ahead and say view uh, existing group assessment. Uh, pick the PCI one. We haven't created one yet. We haven't created one yet. Group assessment. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna go ahead and select that now. Your scans, save scans. And this one is still chugging away. Yeah, the baseline report, uh, our console is a Java-based process, and when you're checking through our reports, it can be uh, time-consuming. Uh, a note on that while the thing's running, all of the reports that we generate are in straight XML as flat files. We do provide the schemas, so if you wish to write your own trans uh, XSLTs, transform from our format into whatever format you want, we provide those so you can validate your reports against it. And the other thing is, is that this machine that we're using here for the demo, it's a little, it's a little older. I mean, you know, it, it, we 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 just uh, grabbed it so we could do, um, you know, this demo. So it's not anything to write home about. So what we're looking at here is we're comparing this server against the other one. What are the different, um, you know, what are the differences here? So you'll see that the different versions are here. So if you can. Imagine if this is your one box, right, and you're using uh, CentOS 5.4 or RHEL 5.8. If you do that, um, if you do a patch update and you go back, you run that baseline, and then you'll, it's going to show you these are all the different changes that are there. So here's the hardware changes, network changes. Um, this is how many files were changed, how many are new, how many are non-existent, and so real quickly you can go in here and say, okay. What's the difference? You know, what what's what has um you know has anything started to drift? And it's a nice way of saying, okay, I'm noticing that this box something's going wrong with it. So and that drift could be inadvertent drift or malicious drift if you've got an intruder on your network who's installed something they should not have to the system. Right. Yep. All right, and then um, I'm going to go back to. I'm going to let this one run, although the box is looking a little slow right now. It's scanning, it may not while you start your process. Yeah, now it's finished. All right, so then let's go back and then let's pull up the group assessments. And with the group assessments, it's going to go ahead and show you what. Um, Let's pick that one. There's a report, and this is going to give you a nice. If right now we only have these two um, VMs associated with this group, but if you can imagine you have a hundred, a thousand different clients associated into this group of this report, how nice and powerful it can be for you. Uh, you can go ahead anywhere you see these little two inverted triangles is where you can go ahead and start to. Um, uh, sort those out. So you see, did it by failures, or I want to do failures here. Okay, sort it by pass. However you want to sort these, sort it by module name. 
the one nice thing about this is so there's two machines in this group, but only one of them here failed for the system log file permission. So I can click on this. It's going to expand. It's always going to give me additional information about that module. Then it's going to cross-reference to different guidelines, and then it's going to show you which one failed. So once again, if you have 100 clients, if you have 1,000 clients associated with this, and you have a group of you know 50 machines that are failing, which ones are failing and why? They would all be listed here, okay, just like it is here um, for this one. So that's a nice, uh, powerful tool to have there. Now let's go to um, group assets report. And basically what the group assets report is just telling you, okay, this is where everything, what's in this group, um, the type of machine, memory, uh, things like that. So you'll see here the OS is, once again, once you start having a lot of clients in a group, you can start to sort these things out, sort by OS. This report is very useful as well because it's showing you as well the version of security blanket that's running. Um, by and large, you need to have a lockstep of uh, where everybody's running the same version of security blanket. This will flag places where it's different. All right. And then you had noticed in that one uh, server I had put in the location, I had put a contact info on this other one I did not, but you can see that you can start to get all that um, information and really start to dig deep in there. Uh, so with with the reports, that's pretty much it there. Um, here's um, the console audit log. This is where you can see what's going on behind the scenes, right? What is the console doing? You have filters here. If you want to search for a specific word, um, I think password should be in here. So let's highlight it, search. And so you're looking for the word password. You're not going to find that nope. in the admin thing unless you change the password. Okay. Um, you're only searching for um, okay. the word. Yeah. So you can do for uh, a word search on scan, let's say, if you just want to see um, what happened there. And there you go. So there is the word scan. Okay. This also allows you to dig deeper into the client, and then that's where you can go ahead and say, um, look at this one, and then here are the filters, go back, word, that's what should be in there. And then uh, tell it to highlight it, search, and then you'll start to notice, I mean, it's scanning, it's checking, it's um, more checking. Doing different baselines. And then there's the word password there. So it's a nice little tool to have of what's going on behind the scenes. This is the scheduler tab with security blanket. This is only available with the uh, um, enterprise edition. So you can go in here and say, okay, I want to create a new um, task. I'm going to pick a profile, or I'm going to pick a group, excuse me. And then I'm going to say every month, once a month, or once a week, or every day at 3 o'clock in the morning, I want to add, I want to perform these different action items. So I'm going to add these different things. First thing I'm always going to do is a baseline. Then I'm going to do a scan, then I'm going to do an apply, and then I'm going to do a scan again. So uh, it really depends on how you have it set up in your own environment. I know I've talked to customers where they can do all these different action items at one time. Um, I've talked to other people where they can only do the baseline and the scan, and then they want to view the reports, and then they want to go ahead and do the apply. So it just, you know, and this is nice that you can customize this. You can uh, set that up for however you want. You save it, and then after that, you can do another group if you like. Okay, so that's the scheduler. Um, then we have the RBAC controls here. So you'll see once this pulls up, it is really, really slow today. Um, there you go. So it will tell you here what the admin can do. Of course, the admin can do everything. Then there's a user. 
security officer and management basically can just um, be some log files and print out a couple things, and that's really it. And that is it. That's security blanket in a nutshell. Anybody have any questions? That you'd like to, uh, that you have at this moment, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, will Security Blanket run on Windows? No, it won't. Um, our expertise here is in the Unix and Linux or in Solaris arenas. Um, I personally have enough information and knowledge on Windows to, con to be considered armed and dangerous to myself. <laughs> um, so we would just assume, stay at the moment uh, with our strengths rather than try and write something for a system that we don't really understand. Alrighty. Um, how often is the product updated? We try and get updates out every quarter to half year. Uh, the last year we've been running a little uh, behind that schedule due to needing to make some rather significant changes under the hood to support the new guidelines from DISA for the RHEL 5 and RHEL 6 DIG. But we have historically have done pretty much every quarter for uh, updates. If okay. we need to do something out of band due to a major change in a guideline, or if we find a major bug, we will do an out of band release as well. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, are you planning on supporting Ubuntu or any other OS not listed? At the moment, the design list for OSs is entirely customer dependent. A uh, customer calls in and says, I have five boxes of OS version foo that I need supported that we don't already do, chances are a little slim. They come back okay. to be at 50,000, uh, that changes things. Yeah, so definitely, I mean, if you have a, a, a need and if it's um, something that, uh, I mean, we're fairly quick to go with, um, you know, with changes here, if it's going to be something that benefits um, security blanket and the customers and, uh, at the end of the day. But yeah, I mean, it just really depends on, uh, on really quantity and things like that, so. Um, can I can I write my own module? No, this was a very deliberate design decision several years back. Uh, in as much as possible, we need to have each one of the modules be as independent from the other modules as possible. Um, even on the development staff, we've uh, made a few mistakes during the development lifetime and had one module step all over what a, what another module would do. Undoing that is uh, interesting at best. So what we've decided to do is not release any sort of development kit for module writing. If a customer has a specific need for a module to do a specific operation, by all means call us. Uh, chances are you're not the only person who may have that need and we may be able to write a module to address it. Yeah, we actually at one time, um, I think it was um, DHS, was it? Somebody contacted us and they said his profile just came out of DHS. You know, do you support it? Can you do anything about it? And we said, well, shoot it over to us. Let's see. And the nice thing is that I mean, you'll notice after a while of um, using security blanket that um, a lot of different guidelines call out for a lot of similar things. Mm -hmm. They just, you know, they're putting it into their own guideline, naming it something else, but essentially it's being used already. Exactly. Um, and so, you know, we got that profile in. I think we had. Most of it already in security blanket. I think we just had to um, add maybe something like 15 or 20 modules. I think it took like a week and a half or so, two weeks to do, um, and we were able to turn that around fairly quickly. So, yeah. and that's a good point. Um, many times, if you have a guideline that we currently don't support, <coughs> chances are the vast majority of that guideline is variation of what is already being done. But this guideline may say a password is 12 characters long. This one may say it's 14 characters long. This one may say account passwords have to expire in 90 days. This one may say 60 days. The raw modules that will say your password length needs to be X are already there. You get to change whatever X needs to be for your guideline. So you may be able to take the guideline and generate your own profile to hit the vast majority of that guideline. The only time you may have to give us a phone call is if there is a specific uh, line item in there that is being done or that we don't have a module for. Uh, for example, if, um, here's one that came up. The, the new RHEL 6 dig that we just announced preliminary support for is now using the RPM database to take care of the majority of file permissions and ownerships. That was a brand new module for us to write. 
the previous versions of the STIG and many of the other guidelines will say specifically file A, B, and C need to be owned by root with group ownership root and permissions no more permissive than 644. Whereas RHEL 6 STIG just says the RPM database, you will run RPM that verify to find out what the correct setting should be and who is no longer correct. So it was a very, a very specific new module for RHEL 6. Okay. Um, does security blanket have to be connected to the outside world? Um, there's an auto update. Um, security blanket can run completely isolated on an air gap network. We have many customers who are running on completely segregated networks. The only networking restrictions on security blanket, obviously it needs to be able to talk to all of its clients over a TCP network. Uh, we have some places, there are some things that you can set if you have a uh, non-standard TCP network with long delays perhaps on connections. Um, we put that in about a year ago. Um, in terms of updates, Security Blanket will not attempt to call home to uh, Ray Town Trust Computer Solutions at all. And if you remember, if you should, when Freddie was up here with the uh, general information, we provide links here to various places uh, that will get you to information, uh, such as looking at your DISA site. If the machine you're running your console on is not attached to the internet, these, those links obviously won't work. For updates, um, you would download those from our website, uh, and if need be, sneaker net, sneaker net them into where your machine is, and then you can install them uh, at that point. And speaking of, of updates, the way the enterprise product is, is updated now, once you've updated the enterprise console machine itself, you can tell the console to go off and update its attached client. You don't have to go off and touch each individual machine. Right, here's the auto update here. With the one restriction, Red Hat 4 based machines. You do need to update manually, essentially reinstall the software the same way you did the first time. Uh, the version on Python on that box does not support features that we need for the auto update. Well, RHEL 5 and RHEL 6 do. That is correct. Yep. That should be yeah, RHEL 4 is the only one who doesn't. Any other questions? Yes. Um, after Security Blanket update, how will that affect my custom profiles that I've created or modified? <coughs> Good question. Um, when Security Blanket updates from one version to another, uh, your existing profiles will not have any new modules added to them. We will not change that, nor will we change values that you may have in a, a, a existing profiles module set. For example, if you set your login manner to be customized for your site, we will not touch that. What Security Blanket will do on an update, uh, let's say, and I'm, I'm making this one up as we go, uh, let's say that for your login banner, um, you have the text of your login banner, and in the new module where it sets the login banner, it uh, has a field now for permissions that you need to set on it. If your old module does not have the field for the new permission values, we will add the default permission values uh, to your module. We're not going to change what you already had there. We're just adding the new option value. If that option value was already there, we won't touch it. So your, your profile will not get any new modules added, existing values will not be changed, the default value for any mission, missing option values for a module will be applied to your profile. Uh, the stock RTCS profiles will be removed and replaced with the new ones. So if, uh, let's say you started with our RHEL 6 STIG profile um, to create a custom module and then uh, are we update the product, you install it, we would highly advise you to go back and compare your custom profile with the new stock profile to see what may have changed. If there are any new modules that, got, that were added, if the default values changed for any reason. Uh, obviously, when the, the various guideline agencies issue an update, they may change those. The new password minimum is now 15 characters where it was 14. Comparing our stock profiles will help highlight those for you. Anybody else? Um, can I undo just certain modules? And it's a bit of a manual process right now. Um, Security Blanket treats things at the profile level when it's looking at things at the console. If you have a specific module that you want to undo, the easiest way is to create a new profile that only has the module you want to undo, and then un associate that profile with your group, and then do an undo operation. Uh, we're still working on the workflow to be able to say, I want to take this profile, 
and only apply, undo, or scan a subset of it. Uh, that's something we hope to release in a future version. But it, it can't um, be done right now. It's just a manual process. Um, can I install the admin console on the same server I want to harden? Absolutely. Um, okay. Most of the customers will actually do that in there. The only constraints on stuff like that is obviously the machine needs to be a supported version, but one of our supported Linux or Solaris versions, and the client that is on the same machine as the enterprise console counts as a discrete client. So if you have your console here with, in this case, we've got uh, 10 licenses allowed by, the, by this uh, console. Uh, we're currently using six of them. You go back here, you can see our six. The EC machine here is the client that's actually running on the enterprise console machine. Um, do I need a dedicated server for the admin console? You don't require a dedicated server. Um, as we talked about earlier, if you're running on a large installation, uh, performance-wise, uh, that may help. The enterprise console is written essentially using Java in there. Uh, Java can be a little um, memory intensive, when it's, especially when it's comparing large XML files. Uh, you can see just when we were running things here, it was uh, um, lugging just a little bit on some of the larger baseline comparisons. What are the software prereqs for Security Blanket? We made a real effort when we developed Security Blanket to require you to have anything arcane on your box. With the possible exception of Java, everything you would need should be on your vendor uh, media installation disk, <laughs> just from Red Hat or Oracle um, or, so, or uh, wherever you're going to get your OS from. Um, as I said, Java is the one thing you may need to go and get either the official Oracle Java packages if you wish to, or your environment requires it, rather than using OpenJDK if that's on your install media. Uh, for Red Hat, <coughs> you have to go off and get the official Java packages. The version of Java that ships with the Red Hat platform is a recent enough version. We need Java 1.6 or Java 1.7. Uh, how is it licensed? License, licensing is done per seat when it comes down to the clients. Each client will uh, will have to have a license that can be given to it. The enterprise console all, is also has a license, and the license for the enterprise console encrypts how many clients can be attached to it at any point in time. Right. So it um, really it just it doesn't matter if it's a if it's a virtual machine or it's a physical machine. You still need a license for that. And another question that we get um, as well is, well, I only have um, one actual server, but I'm going to copy it, you know, 300 times. Our you know, our stance on that, or the way that we look at it is that, you know, those 300 other machines are going to benefit from what you've done with security blankets. So, really, you still need to purchase and pay for for all those 300 other copies and images that you're going to be using. So, that's the way that we look at it, just because, you know, it was used on that only that one server, but it's still going to benefit all the other servers. So. Correct. And in the enterprise world, the only con the only license that you would come talk to us about is that for the enterprise console itself. And that license key will tell it, again, how many clients it can have. The enterprise console and each client will negotiate a transient license uh, on the fly to do any of the scan, apply, undo actions that are tasked. The one other exception is for a Z-Series or Linux on a Z-Series installation where the licensing is done per IFL for Z-Series clients. So if you wanted to put 1,000 Linux clients on an IFL, to say I'm licensing one IFL, anything running on that licensed IFL would be allowed to run. Two IFLs or three IFLs, however many you need. But so what happens, Sorry, what happens if Sorry, go ahead. Okay. What happens if a machine machine dies or is repurposed? I, since the license key is tied to the MAC address of the machine for Linux or the host ID for Solaris, um, if it's a client machine, it's easy to do. You just do whatever you need to do to recover the machine, then re-register that machine with the enterprise console. If it's your console machine, uh, or if you happen to be a standalone box, then you need to get back to uh, RTCS and we can free up that license key and issue a new license. Obviously, if you're having boxes that die, 
uh, Monday morning, every single morning, we'll want to talk about that. But as we understand in an enterprise environment, things change. So we can, we can address that. Okay, thank you. Can Security Blanket use whatever system authentication me mechanism that is in place? At the moment, no. The accounts for the Enterprise Console are kept within the Enterprise Console only. Uh, we're still evaluating a few pieces to let the Enterprise Console uh, talk to your system authentication, such as Active Directory. Likewise, if you're still running NIS, okay. NIS or NIS Plus, um, but that's going to be a future feature. Okay. Um, I've got many machines all accessing a SAN. Um, how do I prevent all of them from messing with it? Security Blanket has uh, a concept that we call the exclusion list. Uh, we didn't really discuss it <coughs> excuse me, here, um, but let me pull up a profile here. Makes it look better. Um, there are files that exist on each client as well as what you can do here in the Enterprise Console with a module uh, to say if you see uh, anything that is in one of these directories, it should be ignored. Um, we can tell it to uh, include special file types as opposed to your standard EX234. Uh, I think BitFS and a few others are on the standard inclusion file type list. Um, we can also say that certain files we know are approved to be SGID or SUID. Um, our default list were built from the vendor's ISOs in there. Uh, if you have a group environment with 15 clients, they're all talking to an exabyte style SAN, obviously you don't want to have everybody hammering a SAN at one time. Normally those SANs would be excluded because the uh, file type for the SAN would be something like SANFS or a third party file type in there. But if they appear to be a straight EXT4 file system, you might want to sit there and say, no, 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 everybody except one machine should ignore the SAN mount point. So you would create in, in here on your profile, you would add a new exclude DERS to tell it, okay, everybody running this profile should exclude that mount point. On the one machine that should be monitoring the SAN, uh, you would have to manually go make a slight change to a file on that machine to say, no, you should monitor the SAN. There's a chapter in the uh, admin guide here on how all these things play together, and in that situation, you can always call uh, RTCS so we can walk you through the steps as well. Okay. Any other questions? No. no I think that's so. it. Okay. I mean, I, I want to mention a couple last-minute tidbits before we, we sign off here. Um, um, most of the calls for support that come into Security Blanket, I'd say an overwhelming amount, maybe 70 to 80 percent, are really um, installation questions. And, um, you know, I know people get excited, want to start using software, and just start slapping it on a machine. Um, we would hope that uh, people would take the time to go through uh, Chapter 2, I want to say? Chapters 2 and 3 yeah. in the admin guide. And that really goes through just, you know, just make sure that you've got the right, you know. Um, it goes through and says, if you're installing the console, what versions of Java are required? Right. A little bit about minimum space on the machine, a few things like that. The Chapter 3 will go through how the various pieces get installed, including setting up the SSL certificates that we use to encrypt our communications. Uh, well, I've had more than a few customers who don't follow basic things like how long should the pass for be in there, and they go fix that and everything is golden at that point. <laughs> or little things like when they enter the license key, they got a number one and a lowercase l confused. Right. So, you know, that that's one thing, just, you know, you got the food for thought, just think about that uh, once you, um, you know, get security blankets in your hands. We do uh, offer a, a, a one-week trial. Uh, for um, security blanket, you can either pick a standalone or an enterprise. Enterprise solution is typically one admin console and um, and a client, just so you can get an idea uh, for that. Of you know, kick the tires on security blanket, get a feel for it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, we can definitely do that. We like doing that. People uh, love testing it out, and nine out of ten times, they love it so much that they purchase it. So. And I would highly encourage anyone interested in the product to do the trial. 
we can sit here and say that does the sun, moon, and stars right. always makes your toes fall butter side up. But until you put it on your hardware and see how it works in your environment, um, it might be able to do all those things, but it just do, doesn't do it the way that you want. You need, testing the software out will really show you how what it can do for your organization. Um, all right, I think that that is about it. So uh, we thank you guys for attending this uh, demo, and um, you know, please feel free to um, you know to reach out to us and let us know if you have any other uh, questions, interests, or you guys might be interested in a trial. Okay, thank awesome. you. Awesome, thank you. All right, thank you guys. All right. Bye. All right.